<laughs> well, praise the Lord. Um, let's look at Luke chapter 8. Luke chapter 8. Yes, I do. Luke chapter 8. I cannot believe that we are one week away from Thanksgiving. Unreal. Time is time is flying. This has been a crazy, crazy year. Luke chapter 8. Verses 1 through 3. We're going to look at a lady by the name of Mary Magdalene. And her faith and about her living for the Lord. Luke chapter 8 verse 1 says this. And it came to pass afterward that he went throughout the, every city and village, preaching and showing the glad tidings of the kingdom of God, and the twelve were with him. And certain women which had been healed of evil spirits and infirmities. So these were women that were healed. Of, they were demon-possessed and they were very sick. Uh, Mary called Magdalene, out of whom went seven devils. And Joanna, the wife of Chusa, Herod's steward, and Susanna and many others, which ministered unto him of their substance. So the aspect about Mary Magdalene. Um, Mary, the, Mary comes from the word Miriam. And uh, we know about Mary, the virgin mother of Jesus and the mother of James, the mother of Joseph, and the mother of Cle Cleopas, and the mother of Mark. And she was from the town of Magdala. Look at Matthew chapter 15. Matthew chapter 15. And the word Magdala means watchtower. It says in verse 39, And he sent away the multitude and took ship and came into the coast of Magdala. After the feeding of the 4,000 people, he got in the boat and he went to this town called Magdala, where Mary Magdalene was, was at. Uh, we looked at, at Luke chapter 8, her past life. Um, the fact is that she had seven demons uh, residing with her, plus she was very, very sick. And everybody has a past. And the great thing about the followers of Jesus is that no matter what type of past they had, it did not affect their future once they gave their life to Christ. Didn't matter how bad of, of a situation, a reputation they had, God, Jesus reversed it by, by them following after him and following with him. And so um, she was a follower and it says that he took Mary with him. Well, why did he take her and not the maniac, Gadara? Because God has a purpose for everybody. We know the maniac, Gadara, Jesus said, go home to thy friends and, and tell, show them what great things will have done for thee and it had compassion on thee. Whereas Mary Magdalene had a different gift of ministry that she could use to help Jesus as well as the followers. And so once again, we go back to that calling that God has given to us. Everybody has specific calling to help out other people. And we don't uh, compare it because each one of us as unique individuals have a specific purpose and God's will for our lives is the should be the most important thing. And so it doesn't matter what one person is doing, another person is doing, what should matter is that, Lord, am I being faithful to what I'm supposed to do? And so if we looked at that aspect of um, uh, Mary Magdalene, uh, let's go back to that, uh, Luke, uh, Luke chapter 8. And we want to look at this, this, just this thought. This first thought is uh, gratitude. Can you imagine how she was thankful, how, how Jesus, because Jesus, and certain women which had been healed of evil spirits and infirmities, Mary called Magdalene, out of whom went seven devils, and Joanna, the wife of Chusa, Herod's steward, and Susanna, and many others, which ministered unto him of their substance. 
And so the aspect of gratitude, they ministered of their substance. Now, some had financial backing, and that's great. But then other people had other ways of ministry to show thankfulness and gratitude to the Lord. Now, next week is Thanksgiving, and I, I like Thanksgiving, and I like the fact of all the foods and all the smells and all those stuff and, and family getting together and things like that. But the aspect, the, the whole thought of thankful Thanksgiving is to be thankful and to show gratitude for what we have. We are blessed people. We may not have what other people have. We may not have as much as we used to have, but we are blessed people. You know, we may not have a lot, but if we have someone that loves us, we have a lot. If we have a home, we have a, just think about this, is that you could turn on your hot water and it comes on, doesn't it? Something as simple as hot water, just by turning on a faucet. We are blessed people. We can go to a switch and flip it on, and we have lights. We are blessed people. We can have heat or cold just by flipping a switch. We are blessed people. Just some of the most simplest of things. You're going to go to your stove. You're going to cook some part of the dinner. You're going to go to your stove or to even a microwave, which didn't even have until the mid-70s. And we're going to push in three minutes or five minutes, and outcome is going to have a, a potato that's going to be cooked. And I'm going to just put a little bit of butter in there, a little bit of pepper, and you're going to have a meal within five minutes. We are blessed people. It doesn't have to be the great big things. It's the little things that matter. It's the most simplest of things that we overlook on a day-to-day -day basis. Friends. Thank God we have friends. This last week, I, um, my heart was broken because two of my mentors of North, and were living in Northern Virginia. One is 92 right now. And uh, his wife, I talked to her on, on Sunday night, and she was telling me about her dad, who, I mean, just loves the Lord. He could, I mean, he doesn't know, uh, there's, everyone's a friend to him. In fact, when you, when we were there last time, he was working at Chick-fil-A. And you know what his job was, he got paid to do, was to tell people about Jesus Christ. He would walk and help the people carry, carry the, the tray and sit down. And then he would, can I get you, can I get this, this? Oh, by the way, this is why I'm doing it, because Jesus loves you. He literally got paid by Chick-fil-A because he had such a great personality and a great reputation that no matter who he talked to, everybody just accepted him. That was his gift. He fell, tore the rotator cuff in his shoulder, and they put him into an assisted care, and his, wife, and his, and his daughter said, um, if we'd have kept him in, one more week could have been dead. Thank God we got him out of there. We got him to a... a Martha Washington Hospital, and all of a sudden he's doing better. He's at home. I got a message. He's at home right now. And she said, it's by the grace of God that he's even living. And while he's in the hospital, his wife is battling breast cancer, and she's in her 90s. Dear, godly, loving people, loveless in the night of death. So finally, I, got, I, I tried calling him. I tried calling him. I called his daughter and said, have your dad call me. So he called me Monday, and we just had just a wonderful time just sharing about how good God is. He said, I'm a living, walking miracle of God. I have breath. I can walk. Yes, I'm hurting. I'm sore, but I'm a lot blessed person than a lot of people are. 92 years old. He said, I have my wife. I have my children. I'm blessed. And then another friend of mine, three years ago, was uh, hit by a car when he was going to get his mail, and they hit him, and he got knocked off into a ditch, and he almost died. And this that two weeks ago, he fell on his neck, and it hurt, and he went to the doctors and said, you know that your neck could have been broken. And he's... 
I call him the ever ever ready bunny. I mean, the bunny just he keeps going. I talked to him. I said, Brother Joey, how you doing, buddy? He said, Brother Jimmy, I just keep on going. I said, I know you do. But having friends means a lot. And you don't have to be around them all the time just to know that you have them as a blessing. And I was talking to Papa Jim, I was talking to Jerry, and we are talking, and, and just the fact he said, how you doing, Brother Jim? Been praying for you. I know it's rough, but God's going to see you through. Just keep your eyes on Jesus. No matter what comes your way, give it to the Lord and let God take care of the rest. That's the mentoring that I got. And I needed during those times that were very turbulent up in Northern Virginia. But I just, I just thank God that I have people that I've been able to know in my past that I can talk to. I'm grateful for that. You know, I think sometimes we take for granted the very simplest of things. You know, I did this, I said this before, and God was working on my heart when I was picking uh, you folks up for church. And God was saying, you know, I think you need to uh, either write a, write a note or make a phone call to at least one or two people. Just tell them how thankful you are for them. That's what you need to do for this Thanksgiving. You need to call people, certain people. And I'll lay them on your heart, and, and I want you to call them. They need to hear from you how much you appreciate them. See, we sometimes devalue our lives because of our circumstances, and yet outside the devaluation zone, there are people looking at us and say, you know what, I need that person as my friend. I need that person as a friend. So when you, when you have good friends and you have what you have, you and I are blessed. We're not sleeping in a tent. And I heard that next week they're talking about the possibility of mixed weather. We're not going to be outside in, in that type of weather. Thank God for that. It's just the simplest of things about gratitude. Let's look at some verses regarding gratitude. Look at Ruth chapter 2. Ruth chapter 2. Look at verse 10. Ruth chapter 2 verse 10 says this. Then she fell on her face and bowed herself to the ground and said unto him, Why have I found grace in thine eyes that thou shouldest take knowledge of me, seeing I am a stranger? Why, did I, why do I deserve to get what you're giving to me? We could ask, why do we deserve what God gives to us? It's called grace. It's God looking at us and saying, you know what? I love them enough that I have a, a specific plan for their lives and they're important to me. Look at 2 Samuel chapter 9. 2 Samuel chapter 9. One of, my one of my most favorite stories in the Bible about Mephibosheth. In fact, brother uh, Miss Karen, that, this is her favorite Bible story. I remember I preached on it one time and after church said, I just want to let you know that's my favorite Bible story. I love the story about Mephibosheth and David. I love that story. I've preached about this so many different times. But it says in 2 Samuel chapter 9, verse 1. And David said, Is there yet any that is left of the house of Saul that I might show him kindness for Jonathan's sake? He's sitting in, in the, in the, uh, on the throne and thinking, Jonathan was so good to me. I need to repay him because we made a vow to each other. So he openly says, does anybody know if there's anyone left out of Jonathan's family that I can show God's kindness to? Yeah, go up, to the, go up in the mountains of Lodabar. There's a crippled boy up there by the name of Mephibosheth. Go show, because that's, that's one of his relatives. Gratitude, gratitude. 
And a lot of times, gratitude, God has to remind us, maybe not at that moment, but it may take some time. And I'm finding out, the very fact is this, is that what we may think has been a pause of time when we show the gratitude is exactly the time that that person needs that. I can't tell you how many times that since Lucinda's passing, I've had preachers, I have people, friends of mine, uh, just call me up at a time that I really just needed to hear from somebody that was friendly away from Kansas. And bless my heart. Think about Brother Terry Brown. I don't think there's ever a, as close a friend as I've had as Brother Terry Brown. That man loved me, loved Lucinda, loves this church. And if it wasn't by the, uh, the grace of God, would have been the first pastor, but it worked out that, who was the first pastor? Wayne Richardson. They were friends in Springfield. And Brother Terry was supposed to come here, but couldn't, and Brother Wayne came in. Talk about the providence of God. So the Browns love this church and love the ministry here. I had a chance to talk to him after his, his mother-in-law passed away just recently. I just sent him a note, just said, I just want to let you know I'm praying for you and your wife. And uh, if there's nothing I can do, I just want to let you know I love you, appreciate you so much. It's people like that that God gives to us. Sometimes we may take for granted, but God says, you know what? Just let them know you're thinking about them. Just let them know. Gratitude. Look at Acts chapter 28. Acts chapter 28. Acts 28 verse 10 says this. Acts 28 verse 10 says, Who also honored us with many honors, and when we departed, they laid it upon us with such things as were necessary. I think about the many missionaries that have come through these doors. I think about that group home that was out in Sun City, Kansas. Say, do you know where Sun City is? I mean, it's just a blip in the road. And, and Brother Gary and I and Brother Larry and, and some other folks got loaded up. I mean, we loaded all kinds of stuff up there. And they still have that group home going. Adopted several of those kids. Ministered a lot of girls. Now they're standing up to, um, to, for, for people's rights uh, regarding uh, Christianity. And there's a little sun city. Mrs. Woods messaged me and she said, I just want to let you know, Brother Fry, I appreciate you being out there and what I've heard, just keep on keeping on. I messaged her when they were doing some struggles to let you know, Brother Mrs. Woods, I love you. Thank you so much. still remember when you came out and your family came out and you sang and ministered to the church and I was so thankful. I'll never forget walking in that, that uh, your home and allowing uh, your, your people from the group up coming in and helping us unload the stuff and seeing you this weeping, thinking, wow. That's what we needed. And we've been blessed. It's memories like that that lets me know that what we're doing here matters to other people. They still remember those things. And it blesses their hearts. Gratitude, gratitude, gratitude. And Let's look at another verse. Let's look at uh, Psalms 9, verse 11. Ways to show gratitude. Ways to show gratitude through song. Now I have a bus route. I have my own bus route, and I've got about 65 kids I pick up every, every morning. And when I pick my first kid up at 6.43, it's quiet on the bus. But by the time I pick up my last kid at 7.25, it's loud. And so uh, you get all those kindergartners all the way through 12th graders, and they're packed, and, and they're loud, and I just stop the bus, 
I had to go out to Baker Township. I had to park the bus for a little bit because I had to turn around. I just stopped. I said, let me ask you a question. Got real quiet. How many would like to hear me sing? <laughs> One little kid said, hear you sing? No. I said, so if you don't want to hear me sing, I don't want to hear you yell. Is that a fair deal? And one of the high schoolers said, absolutely, it's a deal. You little kids, shut up. <laughs> but singing, it, it, brings, it, it brings not just encouragement to us, but it says in Psalm 911, it says this, sing praise to the Lord, which dwelt in Zion, declare among the people his doings. Declare among the people his doings. One of the ways we show gratitude to the Lord is by singing. Just by singing. But also, uh, look at Psalm 67. Psalm 67. Look at Psalm 67, verse 3. <coughs> it says this. Let the people praise thee, O God. Let all the people praise thee. It was four years ago. In December, we had a combined service with the Spanish church. And I'm trying to get that once again, the beginning of the year. And, um, and I had took, taken a video, a little bit of the church service, but mainly of all the food and the fellowship like that. I'm thinking, boy, and I remember the singing, the service, the sweet spirits over here, thinking, this is just what a, this is not even a, a drop in the bucket of how great heaven's going to be with every nation, tribe, and tongue singing praises to God. And it's not all going to be in English either. Can you just imagine what a great choir that's going to be singing praises to our God? Let all the people praise thee. So it doesn't matter what nation tribe you're talking is that the Bible says we're all supposed to praise him. And singing to him, it brings honor to him. But also, look at Hebrews chapter 13. Hebrews 13. Hebrews 13, verse 15. Hebrews 13, 15 says this. By him, therefore, let us offer the sacrifices of praise to God. No, sacrifices, an act of worship, continually. That is, here we go, the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. See, when we give in an offering, that's a sacrifice. That's an act of worship. When we sing, it's just as important as giving money in the, in the offering plate because who you're directing it to. Giving thanks to his name. Let it be continually the fruit of our lips. Bob Jones Sr., the old Methodist preacher. Um, he was preaching a revival. And as the the song director was trying to lead the singing and the people weren't singing. So he was frustrated. And so he said, uh, he gets up there and try to encourage the people and that he got a mat. And so um, one of the, the first lines of the songs were marching to Zion says, let those refuse to sing who never knew our God. So you folks that are not singing are just telling the rest of us that you don't know who God is. You need to get saved right now. Because if you're a Christian, you have something to praise God about. You have something to be able to sing praises to. And then we don't have to make up our own words. We can sing from the experiences of other people. That's why we have this hymnal. These people that have gone before us, who've gone through those hearts and habits and problems and breakdowns and things like that, who 
God gave them the songs in the night and they've been passed throughout the ages of time that we can relate to. So the aspect of fruit of our lips. But then also, look at 1 Peter chapter 2. 1 Peter chapter 2. First Peter 2 verse 9 says this. It says, but ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people. Here's who we are. That ye should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Yes, we are chosen. Yes, we are we have part of the royal priesthood. Yes, we are a holy nation, and yet we are very peculiar, which we are unique. And because of our heritage, our Christian heritage, we should show praises to the Lord. Why? Because we're saved. I didn't do a lot, of, a lot of singing positive songs before I was saved. In fact, most of the things I said and sang were very gloomy and doomy and very self-destructive. But as a believer, we have something to be thankful for that lifts us up, that encourages us. And why do we sing? Because we're saved. That's putting that the new the new words in our lips. Just the very fact is that thank God we are saved. We got to go back to the day that we got saved. How God changed and transformed our lives, and and it just continues to transform us day after day after day after day. And when you look at how where you are right now, you didn't even don't even look half don't even look at all like it was when you first got saved in the spiritual sense. Why? Because God's changing us. He is, he's making us more into his image, not the world's image. So every Thanksgiving, every day, we ought to be saying, you know what? Thank you, God, for that. Ain't God good to give us so many blessings. Undeserving, that's who we are. We are a blessed people. And so the aspect of gratitude is, um, it's a test of character. You know, there's two types of people in this world. There are givers and there are takers. I want to be a giver. I want to be able to experience and be that channel that, to bless other people with. Jack Howells, which was one of my pastors, used to say, this is how I pray. He'd get down and say, Lord, I pray that you bless me in a way that I could be able to, to bless other people. And God would bless him. He'd take the blessings and he would share it to other people. He'd get back on his knees and say, Lord, that was great. Let me do some more. You know, when you get in the aspect of giving of your time and your talents and your treasures for the Lord, and you see how it blesses and lightens people up, you just want to do more of it. You can't do enough to be able to experience the greatness of an almighty God. I think about two years ago, we went around for Thanksgiving, and we had some families in the church that had some struggles and stuff. And so I had the, those kids. I said, let's sit down. We're going to buy them Christmas. We're going to give them Thanksgiving dinner. And so, okay, you three, let's write down what we need for Thanksgiving dinner. So, okay, what do you need for Thanksgiving dinner? Turkey, stuffing, potatoes. And so they, I said, okay, this is what you do. Here's your budget. You take your list. I'm going to take you to Walmart. You stay within that budget, but you get everything on that list. And I'll meet you up at the front. I said, so what are we doing? I said, I want you to understand how much it costs, but how are you going to bless other people with this? Because they may not have that, but you've been blessed to have someone that could help you with that. Well, let's just be a channel. What's a channel? We'll figure this out. This is called giving back to people who you don't know that you could be blessed. I mean, they went into Walmart kicking and fighting, and I said, just be quiet. Just do what you're told. And from the nasty complaining attitude 
I said, now after you know this, I said, okay. So I went to the, um, I went to the, to the checkout person. That's when they had checkout people there. And um, I said, let's subtotal all these different orders. And I want them to bag up their own stuff and I want them to keep everything by themselves. And so, and so they kept all their stuff and they found they all stay within the budget. I said, now the next thing you're going to do is you're going to go to the doorstep with that stuff and you're going to knock on the door and said, hope you have a great Thanksgiving. And by the time we got those three done, and one young man and two young ladies, by the time they got done up to the third person, they were weeping. What's wrong? Are you okay? There's something inside us that feels warm. I said, it's not indigestion, isn't it? No, it's not indigestion. What is it? It's just something about we help people. That's what we're trying to get across to you. You went from having a nasty attitude. Now you're sweet and tender and you're happy. Why? Because it's not about you. It's about everybody else. And I've had those same kids. One got adopted down in Oklahoma. I talked to him about a month ago. He said, are you still a pastor of that church? Yes. He said, I just want to let you know. I was telling my, my parents about what I had a chance to do for one Thanksgiving. And they like it so much that we're going to do this this year to some people in their church. And uh, great. He said, I just remember how my attitude changed after I got a chance to take the groceries I had in my hand and take into the people's houses and to see their gratitude. And I got hugs from people I've never seen before, but I'd never see again. But it just felt good because when I left out of there, they were happy. Well, of course, that's part of the giving. That's part of gratitude. We can't outgive God, can we? And God just doesn't say, open up your wallet. He says, open up your life. Sometimes open up our lips. Gratitude. Mary Magdalene was a follower of Jesus because of gratitude. It is the acid test of their character. Because we saw in, in verse 3 of uh, just, uh, Luke chapter 8, is that these folks contributed from their own resources. So look at Mark chapter 15. Mark chapter 15. Look at verses 40 and 41. She went from being demon-possessed and very, very sick to be demon free and healed all the way to the cross. It says in verse 40, there were also women looking on afar off among whom was Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of James, the lesson of Joseph and Salome, who also when he was in Galilee followed him and ministered unto him, here we go, and many other women which came up with him unto Jerusalem following all the way from salvation all the way through the trial to the crucifixion. Now look at verses 46 and 47. Not just the crucifixion, but also the placing in the tomb. And he bought fine linen and took him down and wrapped him in the linen, and laid him in a sepulcher, which was hewn out of a rock, and rolled a stone upon the, unto the door of the sepulcher. Here we go. And Mary Magdalene, and Mary the mother of Joseph, beheld where he was laid. Quite a journey, isn't it? Why, can you imagine from the time that she came to know, meet Christ, all the miracles she saw, all the great things in the, I mean, you talk about mountaintops. And then when there's a time where there's a whole lot of people walked away from him, walked away from Jesus. When Jesus went to his disciples, says, they've left, will you also go away? That's John 6, 66. We also go away. She stayed. Because Jesus had so changed her life. So she went from the mountaintops of all the miracles 
to the heartbreak of seeing many of Christ's disciples walk away from him all the way through the, the trial and seeing the disciples. Man, where are the disciples at? She is right where the crucifixion is. Most of them are hiding in a room. She was loyal to the end. Gratitude. Gratitude. But then also, let's look at Luke chapter 20. Luke chapter 20. Look at verse 1. So she sees him. He, she anoints the body with, with, with all the different spices and they seal the tomb. Three days later, first, verse 1 of, of John chapter 20, the first day of the week cometh Mary Magdalene early when it was yet dark up unto the sepulcher and seeth the stone taken away from the sepulcher. She's not done following the journey. The journey's not over. Step by step, moment by moment of time in these different times of Jesus, Mary Magdalene is found there. Even at the resurrection, even at the resurrection, it says in verse 2, Then she runneth and cometh to Simon Peter and the other disciple, which is John, whom Jesus loved, and saith unto them, They have taken away the Lord out of the sepulcher, and we know not where they have laid him. So she goes to the tomb. He's not there. He's not there. Look at verse 15. Or 13 through 15 says this. John chapter 20. Or verse 12 it says, but, And seeing two angels in white sitting, the one at the head and the other at the feet, where the body of Jesus had lain, and they said unto her, Woman, why weepest thou? She said to them, Because they have taken away my Lord, and I know not where they have laid him. Notice what she says. My Lord. And when she had thus said, she turned herself back and saw Jesus standing and knew not that it was Jesus. Jesus saith unto her, Woman, why weepest thou? Whom seekest thou? She supposed him to be a gardener. You talk about just the shock. Said to him, Sir, if thou have borne him hence, tell me where thou hast laid him, and I will take him away. She was so worried about where's the body at. If you know where it is, and I will now, I am sure if you've ever tried to carry someone that is dead weight, it's almost impossible. I think about the last few times when the cinder fell and it was by the grace of God. If it wasn't for the fact that we had hospice there, I could have picked her up. And now she was not that heavy at the end. But the fact is, here's this woman says, hey, if you'll tell me where he's at, I will move him. I will move. Just let me know where he's at. She turns around. There he is. And just think about this. The step is where you go. You have the, the devils. She's extremely sick. She goes all the way through Jesus' earthly ministry, through the crucifixion, to the laying the body into the tomb. They coming to be able to anoint the body at, at, on, the third, on, the, on the first day of the week. She was the first one. Look what he says. Jesus saith unto her, Mary. She turned herself and said unto him, Rabboni, which is to say, Master. Of all the people, the first person that Jesus saw coming out of the tomb was Mary Magdalene. What a walk of faith. What a privilege just to hear the aspect of the, your very name spoken by the Master. What a glorious day that's going to be when we get to heaven to hear the Lord call us by name. Now, I've been on this bus route for about two and a half weeks. One of the people on the, on the, inside the bus barn said, how many of the kids do you know? I said about six by name. Why? Because those are the ones that are the troublemakers. 
the ones that don't cause any trouble, I don't become buddy or how you doing. I don't have a specific name. But those kids, I know them by name. And they know what I call their name. They know to look up and pay attention because they know I've got them doing something. But I have one boy who's, I was talking to the teacher. She said, I've never seen a boy respond to another person like he's responded to you. What do you mean? I said, he was a little devil. I said, do you know that after he got off the bus that first time that you were talking to him, he was crying? I said, I know he's crying. He said, you know what? She, she, no, this is what I'm going to tell you what he told me. This is exactly what he said about me talking to him. He said, I've never had someone love me like that. He's a second grader. I've never had anybody love me like that. I'm trying to correct him. And I'm talking to him. He gets on the bus. He said, give me a fist bump. I've had a great day. This morning he says, don't touch me. My morning's been bad. Okay. But he got on the bus this afternoon. He said, man, my day is great. And his dad was there. And I saw the dad, and he said, I just wanted to tell you, bus driver, keep up the good work. You don't know. I've never had anybody love me like that. Apparently, that young man was searching. Part of his behaviors was attention-seeking. I didn't know that. I just knew that I couldn't keep the kid in one seat. It was like a Pop-Tart. I'd see him up here, see him right here, see him over here, all over the place. You just don't know. Just a little recognition can do to people. And every morning I call him by name. When I see him get on the bus, theater, I call him by name and he lights up like a Christmas tree. Because the fact is that someone took the time to remember the personal name of him. And just think that our Savior knows us all by name. And one day, I'll hear Jesus and they said, Jim, I prefer Jimmy, but one day I'm going to hear that from my Savior. Mary. Just let that sink in. I'll end with this. The first person that Jesus saw, he called her by name. So you know there had to be a, a a strong bond there, an appreciation. Because Mary was doing everything she could because she was fraught. You know, when, when you go to a tomb, you expect the body to be there. Just to hear about the fact is that Mary. And that woman is in the hall of faith. Not much said, just a few little lines here and there. But I think the one telling thing is that just one word. Says it all, Mary. That's it. How important we are to him and the most simplest and most intimates of times when the Lord talks to us one-on-one, -on -one, we should be more grateful more than ever before is that the creator of the universe knows us by name and wants to talk to us on an individual basis. What a blessing it is to be saved, amen? amen? So blessed. And that's part of the gratitude that Mary showed is that she loved Jesus because what Jesus did for her. We serve a great God. What a great God. So let's stop right there with that. So prayer requests. Pray for the church. Pray for the services on Sunday. Uh, Chris's shoe boxes. Um, the lady, the lady said, um, "How many you have?" And I said, 60. And she said, "That's wonderful. You're the first one here. Okay, that's great." I said, "How many are you expecting?" She says, "I don't know, but I do know this. I was waiting to see your church because your church is one of the leading churches in our area." Well, praise the Lord. Your testimony continues to abound. And when she heard about Independent Bible Baptist Church, the first thing she said is that, how many you got? Because we know that you're going to be one of the leaders in Southeast Kansas. 
That's a testimony to you and the people of this church. And that made me feel good. What a great God we serve. Let's pray for those few boxes and they'll get where God wants us to be. Anybody else have a prayer request? Okay? Yes, sir. Yeah. Sure. Sure. We got a lot, of, lot to be thankful for. Anybody else prayer request? Yes, ma'am. <clears throat> Mercy. And, uh, <clears throat> sure. Sure. Right. Right. Yep. Sure. The dementia is really kicking in. Sure. Right. Okay. Okay. We'll definitely pray for them. Okay. Anybody else? Yes, ma'am. Sure, absolutely. Okay. Anybody else for request? Yes, ma'am. definitely pray. There's truly a broken heart behind every door, isn't there? Everywhere you go, whether it be a child or an adult, everyone's struggling with different things. So definitely, there's plenty of play, plenty of people to pray for. Okay? Anybody else? Yes, ma'am. Um, yeah, my mom got out of the hospital. They gave the tumor to a nursing home. They would have been in San Diego, which is 10 hours away from Jasmine. So anyway, what they did was they built on his mom a, a mini home. And anyway, but she's not eating and she's not and she sleeps a lot. So I, I asked Dustin and my nephew, um, you, is she does she have a nurse? And he didn't respond to me. So I'm hoping. She's sure. Got a nurse. sure. If she needs hospice, then you know. Yes. But I don't know. But California is a different world out there when it comes to all that stuff right there. So yeah. just definitely a lot, lot to pray for regarding mom and the family. So it's tough. It's tough when that type of situation people are going through. Mm -hmm. Especially when you're here and you're you're out there. Plays on your mind. I understand all that too. Oh, yeah. Sure. Okay. Anybody else for request? 
Okay, let's um, pray for our missionaries, pray for services on Sunday. God will bless here, and, and God will bless our missionaries across the, around the world. God would use them in a special way. Other uh, prayer requests that have been given, ones that have not been given, we have a lot to pray for. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Let's see what God will do with our prayers tonight. God bless you. Let's pray. Lord, you're an amazing God, and we thank you for different people in the Bible that you bring to life that we learn about and how you just show us from the time that they come to know Christ to time to where what how they use their lives, those snapshots. And Lord, we're thankful for those snapshots that we can learn and we can appreciate uh, that much more regarding these different people and how we can relate with them. And Father, we think about how you've changed our lives from the time before we were saved. And God, you've walked us along to different things. And the Lord, I just think the very fact is just to be able to call by our first name, how special that is to us, and the endearment that it comes by knowing our first name. So Father, I pray you meet the needs here uh, of each one that's here. Father, there's some that have been given, some that have not been given. But Lord, you know our hearts. You know exactly what they are. Holy Spirit of God, help us as we uh, try to, to pray for those people. And so, Father, I pray that you would administer as only you can. You bless our missionaries here and across the waters. Keep them safe as they travel or if they minister, Father. Be with their families. Keep them safe also. Lord, be with the churches in, in America. Lord, that you would help them and all the stuff that's going around our country. Lord, we pray for the peace of Israel. Keep them safe, Lord, as they are they're doing what they have to do to protect themselves. And Father, I pray that your will would be done. And Father, we would trust you more than ever before. Father, is truly a heart. There's a broken heart behind every door. There's people that are truly struggling. Give us the opportunities, Lord, to just share the love of Jesus. Just even if it's just to talk to in a few moments. May you be glorified. May you be blessed. Bless us in all we say and do, Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen and amen. God bless you. Good night, Lord We'll see you on Sunday, Lord willing. If he doesn't, if he does come, we'll see you up in heaven. That's it.